Uh, what are your respective organizations doing within the OP NFB community and with, I guess, with your customers and uh, partners? I mean, I think uh, we're, we're contributing uh, in a number of ways, whether that be on the specific projects. I mean, we're involved in, in quite a number of projects, but I think also we're, we're doing quite a lot of the community work. I think that's also really important to, to maintain a community. Um, the areas that uh, I think we, we want to continue to focus on is very much around uh, the, the, uh, the testing side of things, but also very much around the operations day-to-day uh, -day that I referred to before. I think they become absolutely crucial. But I think also how the communities uh, evolve together. So how we do the integration with, with uh, open daylight uh, becomes very important. But this end-to-end, -end, so we're doing quite a lot of work around the end-to-end -end functionality to make sure that the, the capabilities are in place for the VNFs uh, going forward so that we can provide the kind of experience for those VNFs that they require. I think it's, it's, you know, it's pretty much the same. The, the contributions that we are doing are also along the lines of interoperability testing, the, uh, being part of the, the Pharos lab network so that end-to-end uh, -end solutions can be tested on different infrastructure and we provide the infrastructure for that as well. Uh, and outside of OPNFE as well, we are doing uh, similar work. We, we have an ecosystem of uh, application partners and VNF partners uh, that test end-to-end -end applications and their orchestration on, on our infrastructures. We are also trying to do it, uh, you know, and the lessons that we are learning from there, we are uh, bringing it back here and sharing it uh, within the community as well. We're spending our time uh, in a few key areas. One is making the whole system deployable, and part of that initial deployment includes integration with other components, so whether it's an SDN controller. Uh, I mean, the, the key deployment here, I think, is OpenStack. Uh, yeah. But there's other components that are involved. And so that, that deployment tool becomes a point of integration for all the pieces that need to come together to build up the NFE platform. Big focus for us. Um, another area has been performance. So we continue yeah. to push the um, envelope on performance because um, two things are happening. One, we're having success, which is a good thing, so we need to keep showing the, the commercial value of reducing the cost by using standard high volume hardware. The other thing is network speeds are increasing. So whatever we've, esta we've established as a baseline for today may not be the right number for the future. So we have to keep pushing that forward and we're yeah. looking at um, some performance testing as well as performance optimized stacks. So the fast data stack is an example in the OPNFE project. Um, another area that's important to us is service assurance so that we can show that the, the application that you're running is actually providing the service that the service provider is agreeing in an SLA with our customer to provide. And so there's metrics that we need to extract from the underlying infrastructure, analyze and, and potentially change uh, the runtime operations of the system. That's actually an area that OpenStack today doesn't have enough supporting infrastructure. So OPNFE, I think, has actually really helped make changes in the upstream community. And then the other area, which is kind of our real core focus, is all the ancillary projects that are outside of OPNFE that we bring in and combine to create the OPNFE platform. We spend a lot of time in those communities, in OpenStack yeah. and Linux and KVM and OpenVSwitch and DPDK and OpenDaylight and that whole stack. So it sounds to me that like OP, OP and FE plays a key role in kind of bringing everything together. Absolutely. But, but within carriers, um, one of the things that they, they're not quite famous for is actually adopting change, right? So when, when you have a platform that changes constantly, how do you actually you know, help service providers engage that community if you want them to adopt this kind of solution? I think there's, a, there's already a number of initiatives. Uh, we were talking about it uh, earlier this week. Uh, and, it's, and it's difficult to see where it will actually fit, you know, whether it fits into to own app or whether it fits into OPNFE. But I mean, we already see a number of initiatives around how you actually do the life cycle management, not only of the infrastructure components, but also of the VNFs. Because, uh, and this was where the whole sort of DevOps uh, model comes in and, and CI, CD becomes so important because if you change one component, of course, then you need to make sure that it's not impacting anything else in the stack. So w where uh, a lot of that focus is around understanding and automating the test suites to make sure that if you change something, how does that impact everything else? 
what you see before is it still equal or better than what you get when you get uh, after you've made the change. So uh, I think that's one of the areas uh, within OPNFV that they are really leading in terms of, uh, particularly within the open source communities around how we're working with CICD and you talked about Feros as well. I think, I think the, the way we're working with these sorts of things becomes really crucially important within the community. Of course, then you need to translate that into then the service providers network so they also can take advantage of that. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a challenge uh, to, to really move operators and trigger the operators to move to a much more dynamic way of uh, taking software into their network. So, you know, the whole CICD uh, DevOps becomes really uh, a trigger point for them to move uh, going forward. I think one of the other advantages that OPNFE has is it's giving the CSPs that are participating a very safe space to change their work culture and competence of their organization, right? They are doing it in a pretty safe environment here. They're not being thrown out and, into and the ocean and asked to swim. And, right? and you have a community here exactly, that, that, to help them. So that shares knowledge, yeah. So slowly they are trying to see what it would be to operate a operate a network that doesn't look like the old network. So I think that is, to me, that's one of the big uh, things that OPNFE brings for the operator community. Them participating here, even if they're not contributing code, like uh, it was mentioned uh, in the panel earlier today, even if they're not contributing code, they're seeing how it's being operated, how it has to be, how that network could be run or should be run. I think that's a, that's a big plus for them that will, enable again acceleration of the deployments. I, I, I know for a fact that uh, Ericsson and Red Hat is, is uh, supplying a solution to a major US carrier. So perhaps you guys can share a bit of, uh, of experience in you know, helping a carrier deploy uh, a platform that allows them to automate provisioning and cloud resources. Right. I think the first thing is Bala touched on this. We spend all of our time talking about technology. And when it comes to the agility required to consume change in your network just regularly, technology is critical. But it's really process, culture, people yeah. change. And that's the, a much harder part. Uh, so we can, we can build a technology. We can solve a technical problem. It's really hard to change organizational structures and behaviors. And building tools around automation is critical. So in the cases where we do have successful uh, service providers doing significant regular changes, uh, they adopt certain types of best practices. And some of those are, uh, you, you know, you can roll out a piece of your infrastructure and direct a small part of your traffic to it. So you're not exposing your entire subscriber base to yeah. a change. Uh, you know, as, as a simple example, and of course you're gonna do some pre-production validation of that, but you need automation and tooling around that and you also need uh, the people involved to be inspired to take on the learning necessary to operate these new tools. Um, an another example is um, being able to make these sort of small incremental changes yeah. actually can reduce risk overall. And we're, we're, we're operating in a risk averse environment so it's a really big mindset change. Is it? My preferred way of doing this is really bake it for 18 months until I know it's bulletproof and then put it in production. And even there, there's still things potential will go wrong. <laughs> for problems. And so now we're saying that, you know, you can make small incremental changes. There's always a mechanism to roll back or divert traffic elsewhere. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a kind of a, a mindset change that I think is facilitated by tools, but it's, it's, a, it's a long journey to get people. But okay. I think it's also, um, uh, when we start this journey, the first thing that nearly every single operator does is they say, actually, no one organization has the competence to do this. And the first thing they do is create a cross-functional team. As soon as they create a cross-functional team, it's not that immediate problem that they look at and they say, yeah, we need to solve that. They go, we also have the ability to solve a lot of the other issues that, that they have been uh, blocking their organization because now they have communications across organizations that previously didn't communicate with each other terribly well because they've been siloed. So I think that the case that you were referring to is, is very much around looking at how do you actually automate processes across the, the uh, uh, organization 
So you take something that typically is taking 28 days and 30 people to do, actually is automated down to 10 minutes and maybe seven people are involved in that. Uh, that's a, a huge uh, organizational change and it actually uh, frees up a lot of people to actually start accelerating the, the, uh, the roadmap and, and implementation of other projects because you actually start to, most of these projects are, are um, limited by the fact that they have inability to get the right resources in place. When you start to implement these sorts of things and free up people, you actually are able to accelerate your roadmap uh, on, on change in your network. So uh, I think looking at the workflows and the processes that can be automated uh, across the organization actually really become key. And, and in that particular case, it also gives you the, then the ability to make incremental changes in a much more uh, controlled way because you can see what happens before, what happens after. Am I okay with that? Yes, then we're good to go to the next step. Right. I think, you know, I just, uh, as you were talking, uh, I just uh, thought about something we had done. We looked at all the NFE POCs we had done and where they are after the POC. Did it go into commercial deployment? And if yes, why? And if no, why? And uh, there was an interesting number. The POCs that were sponsored by multi, multiple people within the organization had a 63% more chance of getting into commercial production than a regular POC, if it was just sponsored by the CTO group or funded by the CTO group. So a lot more ownership, and I think that that's, that's key, actually. Exactly. Because it's, it, it, the way you do processes, the way uh, you will actually manage that infrastructure going forward will change. I think uh, that's one of the, the, the next big shifts I'm waiting to see. Still, most service providers are actually doing this in a application or a service uh, type manner. Uh, what we see is some of them are actually starting to move, okay, I'm going to operate my infrastructure from one organization and my applications will actually start to consume yeah. infrastructure, not consume capacity or plan their capacity. Yeah. And I think that's the next big mind shift that needs to happen uh, if we're really going to get the, the networks implemented in a, in a very efficient way uh, to allow us to take advantage of 5G going forward. And right. that, that's exactly how, where we've seen success in the enterprise, where I think we're learning a lot of lessons that we're now applying into the, into the network. And it's that separation of duty owning, uh, think of it as a platform, not as a vertically integrated stack. And that platform view is what drives interoperability requirements. Because as long as you have all these independent vertically integrated stacks, you can run them independently. You just haven't really created a, an, an efficiency of operations or, or procurement. And so where I see great success is building a common platform and bringing different applications and really thinking them of applications consuming resources on the platform rather than a vertically integrated Because I think up, up until now, if you ask a VNF, they will all define their own requirements and they will be all different. They will use different language. And really we need to start, if we're going to have very efficiently deployed networks, the VNFs need to start either being broken up into groups. I'm either a really uh, an, a, a data plane yeah. heavy yeah. Uh, application or I'm you know, a fairly lightweight application. I, I don't need a lot of compute. I don't need a lot of memory. Uh, or I'm a, a, a you know, really memory hungry application. So then you'll build sort of three different flavors of infrastructure that's then consumed by applications rather than building 20 different types of uh, infrastructure to, to suit each of the w individual workloads. So I think that's sort of the next transition that we'll see going forward from a, an operator perspective. And we are starting to see some of that trickle into some RFIs and RFPs, mm -hmm. right? but it's really, for the most part, that mindset has not changed. Right? You still see requirements for seven years support on uh, OpenStack yeah. X version. But, uh, yeah. That change will, will come. 